Hello and welcome to another edition of Bulldogs Unleashed. I think we're up to number 10 now, which is pretty amazing. So we have a very special lineup for you this week. Two of the greats of the game. Hazem El Masri returns with one of his former teammates, Rod Silver. Thanks for joining us, boys. No worries, Bill. We're going to talk about the dog days with these two and also assess how the team's been going lately. But our very special guest right here, and I think you might understand why she's here, she actually designed the Indigenous jersey for this week's Indigenous round. Pam Brandy-Hall, thank you so much for being with us. You're welcome. You're a Bundjalung (laughs) artist and you did last year's jersey as well. So, Pam, give us a bit of a yarn about how this jersey came about. I mean, what, what sort of consultation and thought goes into it, especially having done one already for this club? Well, I think you've got to um, this, you know, take notice of what the year may represent in terms of uh, Indigenous people. And this year um, happens to be the um, celebration of the Elders for 2023. So I was guided by that mm-hmm. um, to just pay respects to them as well. Um, but the Rainbow Serpent's always a good topic to talk about, you know. It's, um, so we wanted to incorporate all those things on the jersey and, um, and um, the totems that we have on there at the moment are the handprints and that's belonging. Um, our Aboriginal people, we can use those handprints to support people. We can use those handprints to say, we've got your back. You know, mm-hmm. we're here for you. And, um, and that's how you're brought up as, um, uh, with the elders too. They, um, they're a very big support, grandparents are, for Aboriginal people. And, um, you know, I was brought up with my grandparents and that sort of thing, so I know all that sort of thing firsthand, you know. Um, the water holes, um, and that's the, uh, the, the Wrigley s- circles and that sort of it's thing. Been, yep. And they're the resources that uh, we used. Mm. Um, when we had uh, seasonal changes and that. And uh, the circles, of course, the Aboriginal people and elders who made the decisions in relation to anything that was important within the Aboriginal community. Right. So I wanted to incorporate that and have all that represented in the, um, in, uh, the jersey. And uh, the, the, well, I want to mention the Rainbow Serpent firstly because I think people need to learn about the culture and the relationship with Dreamtime, etc. So tell us a little bit about the Rainbow Serpent and... and what that actually is in Indigenous culture. Yeah, well, he's our, um, we were all brought up and I'm sure Rod might have been told about it too growing up, um, you know, by grandparents. They were always the storytellers. Mm. and um, Knowledge keepers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. and <laughs> educators and yeah. the support system that we had. Um, and it's a verbal, very much a verbal history, isn't yeah. it? It's, yeah, it's yeah. That's, that's yeah. very important. And nothing was written. Mm. It was all verbal or orally handed down. And uh, that would have been done, and in my case, many times in significant places like um, the banks of rivers, creeks and that, which are very mm. significant for Aboriginal people to take their kids because we associate water as being a place of, you know, where we belong. Um, but with the Rainbow Serpent, it's featured on the Jersey artwork as the life giver and protector of waters. Um, and it's uh, the longest uninterrupted mythological traditional anywhere in the world. So it's been yeah, around for a long yeah. time. So it's, it's, um, you, it's told in many, many stories. Uh, the Indigenous jersey has been around a long time now. Rod, from your perspective, uh, we've seen, for example, uh, the concept of women in league round change quite a lot over the years in, in what it means, what it represents, how it helps the community in different ways. What about Indigenous Round? Because from from way back um, to now, it's, it has changed a lot, hasn't it? Yeah, well, uh, this is non-existent when I was playing, so it's fantastic and I really enjoy watching the young uh, Indigenous players come through. They're so proud of their culture. Um, you know, they're um, ambassadors for our culture. Uh, they're speaking up when they should speak up, supporting each other. Um, and then the Indigenous All-Stars and you know, the Maori All-Stars concept is fantastic because we've got two cultures and I'm not leaving out has uh Middle Eastern culture. Well, I'm going to get to that actually because <laughs> um, that's interesting. Yeah. The, the way these, you know, Aboriginals or Indigenous people or rugby league is in their DNA. So it's something that, you know, our, our communities support so um, much and – that concept of playing against the Maoris, I think they're strong as, as we are about rugby league. So it's 
it's a fantastic showcase and I really am disappointed I didn't get to be a part of it. We will talk later in the show about the way you guys played together and the, the period you were together at the Dogs as well as your individual achievements. But has it was an interesting point Rod made because uh, – and we've talked about it on this program and others – uh, you coming to Australia from a very different culture, of course, and you teaching players in the team about your culture and, and, and your heritage. How was it for you learning about Indigenous culture, for example? I mean, there was, there was a lot to get through as a young guy. Absolutely. But just before, <coughs> just to um, say something about what Rock is saying, and I know what all the young guys are taught, uh, you know, speaking up, and, and that's because of the credit that you guys have and the foundation and, and the platform that you guys have actually mm. done beforehand, you know? So the pioneers I've, uh, I've always been like, as I said, guys like rocket. And I was watching actually Steve Runoff yesterday, you know, in his interview and it's very interesting as well, mm. not even speaking out when sometimes they force, you know, when they, when they face racism and that's hard to take sometimes because you are thinking of the greater good for later on, you know? So instead of just sort of, you know, kicking the bucket and just walking off, you know. Yep. So sometimes yep. you need to absorb that and we did that, you know, that generation, you know, mainly yeah. of ours, we had to absorb as much as we can to lay that, you know, footsteps for the next generation to be able to now, you know, I mean, that they, find their voice and be able to sort of speak out. So, um, um, yeah, sorry, what was your question again? <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. you, you, no, you, you've yeah. kind of answered okay. it because, you, yeah. you know. It you, was different, yeah. Bill, it was yeah. different. Yeah, yeah. you yeah. had a different Very ancestry, good. a different a different yeah. cultural we, background, yeah. and so you could sort of identify with it, even though yeah. it wasn't yeah. an Indigenous background. And it was unusual for someone to, to be outspoken, yeah. like, yeah. you got to take your hat off to Chalk Mundine. He, yeah. he was yep. outspoken yep. because, and he said things, you know, and the wider community thought mm. were a bit radical, but if you're from the Aboriginal community, a lot of the stuff he, he says is... is pretty much on point yeah. um, well, it's just the way he, he does things i suppose that um, but how he delivers it yeah how he yeah. delivers it but that you know i've said it a lot in 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 all media that i've worked in over the years that cultural change social t- change doesn't just go click 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 forward like that it, it f- ebbs and flows like waves on a beach sometimes yeah. it goes too far but then it falls back and then it goes a little bit and yeah. that's that's how change occurs it, it never occurs you know, incrementally and, and flows normally. I mean, there will be people who are outspoken. They might occasionally step over that line, but for goodness sake, they might do it once or twice, but the overall good they do um, is far outweighs, you know, the occasional time they might say something that wasn't quite appropriate. Pam, from an artist's point of view, I'd, I'd love to know, first of all, your relationship with Rugby League and, and what you think from your perspective of how this helps Indigenous people and Australians generally. Well... My thoughts while I was doing the design was just to, um, my whole thoughts were just to, not only for the Aboriginal players, but to for the whole team mm. to be inspired by the design because it's for all of them. And um, the, the name of the, the design is called Seasonal Change. So, you know, I think we're due for a, a change. Yeah. In, uh, have, have it changes with the scores oh. in our games. <laughs> We'll get to that. Um, we'll get to that topic. But, uh, yeah, so um, so that was my inspiration for doing the, the for coming up with that design, and at the same time, I wanted to um, pay respects to our elders, mm-hmm. um, and uh, you know, and to um, to my um, background as well. The name of the um, jersey is called Nia Goran. And that's in Bunjalung. It's Yagel Talk from mm-hmm. Bunjalung. Does that mean and seasonal change? It means se- – no. Oh. It mean, well, it's associated with season changes, yep. but it's rain coming. Ah, yeah. right. So Nyangoran, that's what it means, rain's coming. And right. that's the change of the season. So, yeah. So, um, Hopefully yeah. it rains our way. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, and, and, and see, the, the, the idea of this, which I think – Unfortunately, some people might not still understand. Is it? It is inclusive. It's yep. about non-indigenous yep. people yep. having yep. a kinship yep. with their fellow Australians. I, yep. I think some people don't quite understand that part of it. They mm. seem to think of it as going the other way. It's not. Mm. No. It's about embracing everybody. You know, even and, the Pacific and, and Islanders and the the Europeans, yeah, all the people and, involved. And that's like when we when we did the the Ramadan iftar here for the Bulldogs and that, yeah. for example. This is not just a a Muslim thing you know exactly. what I'm saying? to yeah. be able this is actually to for the wider community to come and share yeah. a meal a warm meal together nothing better than actually uniting people within food and sports so yeah. you know what i mean so this is what it's all about coming together you know what i mean sharing a meal learning about one another um so again exactly the same yep. point 
how many different religions went to your iftar dinner? Yeah, there were that, at that, least yeah, four, yeah, I that's think. That's exactly what yeah, it's about, yeah. Exactly. So. And as Rod can attest to as well, I think uh, my love of um, football goes back to the days when um, we developed our own football teams and they were all black and we p- played Tongans and yeah. and Maoris and, um, you know, and we never had these guys in first grade football. No. But they came mm. through these Aboriginal football uh, gatherings and functions on weekends um, to, to be where, you know, yeah. they are today. Yep. So it's, it was just a, you know, a stepping stone for them. But it was a long time coming. You, you do a lot of work in the community too, Rod, and I'm sure there's some Indigenous kids involved in that. Um, of course, kids from all backgrounds. But you, you um, do, do you find that this whole concept has kept getting better? Do you think it's reached a point... You know, where it's um, it, it, it's still improving. It hasn't stagnated yet as a concept. Yeah, I think it's been really good, Bill. And um, I think most of the clubs try and outdo themselves with their jersey designs yeah. because you'll hear all the Aboriginal community talking about which one's the best. Uh, so that's, it's, that's it's a, part like of a the hidden, fun. Yeah, yeah, it's a hidden competition. But um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I think it is. But, but yeah. I think most of them, are, the best part about of the mm. jerseys is. Um, a lot of them have got meaning, and yeah, yeah, yeah. they're not just thrown together. Yeah. It's it's about something, or and it, there's a story to it. So they look sensational yeah. too. You know? yeah. 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 This look, is probably yeah. our best one. Yeah, I, I love you yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of that, that's. I'm, I'm glad you said that. <laughs> well, even though Pam decided <laughs> no. designed last year's, but mm. I, I'm sure you don't mind. Yeah, yeah. I just think no, the domination of the blue and the black looks yeah, really good. Yeah. yeah, I think the first one that we did it was pretty special, but uh, this one here. Is, Certainly uh, supersedes it. It's, and it's the colours are just very iconic of the bulldogs. Yep. And yeah. um, the uh, and the initial artwork we had many colours in it, although it represented the same design. Um, but I think after consultation with Josh and Braden and that, yep. um, and uh, some of the other staff. We decided that we'd go with the blue and the white. Well, my favourite is the hand because we need all yeah. hands on deck at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> we need it. Yeah, we do. Yeah. 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 You're right, has so, right. You know, all the hands yes. we can get is just yeah. right there. Excellent, you know. All yeah. the help we can get. There's yeah. a couple of hands prints yeah. on the all, back. All actually, uninjured which, hands. Yeah. 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 Oh, definitely. And, and I think uh, I think Josh and Braden are pretty good at yarning too, aren't they? Yeah, they uh, they're not they're good bad talkers. When it comes they're both good talkers. Pretty good, yeah. Plenty of culture on Saturday on display at a core stadium in the game against the. Titans. Uh, both teams are heavily involved in this, of course. Uh, they'll form a boomerang in the centre, but there's a lot of stuff going on. Uh, I have been privileged to be part of a smoking ceremony for a rugby game once. It's fantastic. Mm. The players thought it was really cool. Yeah. Uh, that is the non-Indigenous players. Um, so that's a great experience if if our players haven't experienced that before. There's painted boots that the players are wearing that will also have significance. So they're auctioning the jerseys that are worn by the players as well, of course, as being able to buy these jerseys online as well. Lots of artists performing. It'll be a wonderful day. And also awesome. jersey flag, top of the table game between the Dogs and Norths. It's going to be the curtain raiser. So that kicks off at 11.45. So make sure you get there nice and early. The main game's at 2 o'clock. But you can get there nice and early. That way you see a bit of footy, but you can also see all the ceremonies prior to this. Yeah. And um, so you, you haven't really – no, as a player, you wouldn't have had an Indigenous round there. No. Right? I, no I'm disappointed. Yeah. I'm very disappointed. But you can <laughs> – But uh, no, oh, look, I'm, I'm just happy the game's progressed this way, Bill. Yeah. Um, it's good for everyone. And like has, has said, it's not just about uh, the Indigenous players. It's about everyone. Well, Pam Brandy Hall, thank you so much for this beautiful work and uh, and your involvement in this. I hope you have a wonderful week. Yes, um, well, I'm certainly going to be at the game. Good on you. Yeah, Excellent. and bring my mob up from Newcastle. And um, uh, are they going to? They're not going to cheer for the Titans, are they? Uh, no. Good. <laughs> just make sure that they, if they're not, no, they don't go for the Knights, well, do they? Please. I won't just... tell you who they go for, but you know, I'll, I'll keep them in line. And um, but yeah, look. They're very supportive of my involvement in the, you know, been having the opportunity for the last year and this year to, you know, produce this fabulous design. Mm. And um, so they support me all the way and they'll do, certainly be supporting the Bulldogs on the day. <laughs> well, thanks for being with us, Pam. You're and welcome. We look forward to seeing these jerseys getting dirty on the weekend. I uh, hope so. Rod Silver and Hazmal Masri will stay with us as we talk a little more footy after this. <laughs> Betting takes you away from the action. It can distract you from footy's most exciting moments. Don't let a bet take you away from the match. Reclaim the game. 
Be gamble aware. This week's headlines. Welcome back to Bulldogs Unleashed. We're with Hazamil Masri and Rod Silver, two of the greats. And we're going to go behind the scenes now. Our In the Shed segment this week is really about what it was like retiring from the game. We'll have more detail on the great careers of these players in a little while. But first of all, Rod, um, well, you retired before, Haz. Um, and you were one of the last, if not the last, professional players to have a full-time job in the NRL. I don't know how aware you were of that. And what was it like? Um, it was it was hard because I love playing rugby league and I love playing with the teams that I played in. Um, it was just hard transitioning from not playing anymore to you know um, being with your family more and working more. I suppose, although I love being a policeman, um, it was hard. Yeah, that's interesting because you did have that job to go to. You sort of knew that you were secure in it, yeah. and and your role since then. We'll talk about that in a minute. Has been uh, has been very important in the community. Has a little bit different for you because. Particularly in your community, uh, the area you lived in, and and the the, the people you who looked up to you, you know, um, particularly the Lebanese Muslim community in this country, you, you faced a lot of pressure as a player representing them. I know that, and uh, we talked about it in the book. Yep. Um, and then you retired. What? H- how hard was it for you? Uh, look, uh, like like Rock said, um, it's ex- you never want to give it up, and to be truthful, it gets taken away from you. That's mm. that's the end. Of, that's 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 the full <laughs> stop. It actually gets taken away from me because your body doesn't just can't do what your mind wants to. You know, what I mean, you want to get up and you do it in something that you love for the rest of your life, and you want to be able to do it, but you just can't. Your body just won't cooperate with it. You see the gap, and you just can't get through. Or and if you do, you've caused an injury, and you're out for three, four, five weeks. So the transition was extremely hard. I felt. Look, when I first retired, the first few years, it felt like I was injured and wanted to come back there was always like something you know maybe it will happen something you know but um yeah look and and eventually you sort of learn to um you know uh, to pretty much adapt and, and and move on um but it is hard and even to this day sometimes you know when things are unfolding or even when we you know when times are good or when time, times are tough you want to be there because that was that teamwork you just miss that the camaraderie in between mm. coming to the sheds having fun and laugh and Someone, you know, throwing a joke and then you go out there and you're working hard and you come back for one another. You know, you get through very tough times together, you know, and, and, but you actually love it. It makes you a better person. Um, mm. All these things you truly miss. And that's uh, – it's interesting how you put it that way. It's, it, it kind of isn't your decision, is it, really? Even if publicly um, you, you, you've you made the call yeah. as opposed to, you know, being told you're not wanted in a club anymore. But – and also uh, there's a space – that you have to fill, isn't there? Which is not easy. It's not easy on your relationships either. No, well, it, actually, speaking about relationships, I think my wife is happy because I was home. <laughs> she, she went to a lot of things by herself, and I, I saw these guys more than I saw my family. So mm. um, it made us tight as a as a team, and it was great for the team, but um, it was pretty tough for her and the girls. So, how did you find that? space filled i suppose you you went headlong into police work and i guess there's a lot of similarities in some ways but you also would have continued a relationship with the community too that was a big thing for you yeah it was and um our our supporters are so loyal wherever you see them even now um there's a lot of kids that don't recognize you but their parents know who you are and they always want to have a chat and say oh we're we're going you know they want to talk about the team now and and about the good old days Uh, it's really nice because you know, I, I think our supporters are probably the best. But, um, you know, it, it makes you relive all the good stuff that happened. As, um, as I said, your community role didn't change. Uh, you were still very prominent, as Rod said. You recognised down the street everywhere you went. So yeah. that was an interesting part too. How did you how did you fill the space? Yeah, look, it was tough because um, uh, when I when I finished, um, you know, the the questions and um, the, the demand was just overwhelming um, to be able to sort of do that. I did a little bit of work with the NRL at part-time um, and eventually it took a while with the Bulldogs, you know what I mean, to be able to sort of, um, you know, go on the books and um, and get more so and work and work and continue to do so. But in saying that, I was still working and doing a lot of outside work. Um, uh, from a monetary perspective, it was tough too because you wanted to mm. be able to sort of help everybody, but you can't, it's hard. Um, uh, 
uh, and, and as I said, it puts a, it does put a lot of pressure on you because if you do one school, you got to do them more. If you do one junior club, you got to do them more. Yeah. So um, you know, you got to be very selective, and um, you needed a sort of uh, you know a, a base or a source that they would be able to sort of re- relate to or go to. Um, you know, you do have your manager, and your manager's always overwhelmed, and you know he has to filter through a lot of. A lot of sort of how can I say pro- unfulfilled promises, you know what I'm mm. saying? And people say, "Oh, we'll do whatever, okay," until you sign a pen and paper, and that's when it, it, you find the transition extremely hard. And at the time for me, um, you know, I clashed a lot with even with my wife about little things, you know what I'm saying? And I, we ended up getting separated and divorced later on. So um, there's no textbook to teach you what to do next, yeah. you know. Yeah. And um, you know, you, the, you you talk about you know, so many educational things, which is um, fair enough what they, with the NRL and all that trying to do, but there's no actual textbook to tell you exactly how to go about it. And um, the transition for me was extremely difficult. And as I said, at the end of the day, it was, um, you know, paid the ultimate price for it. And But thank God, you know, obviously things are sort of back now. And Well, I'll get back to that. The yeah. ambassadorial role now is, is an interesting one because there are a lot of ex-players. We talk about that. A lot of them have come on this show. And they have different roles within the club. The one that links the club to the community because the existing players have really busy schedules these days. They do yeah. a lot of stuff. Uh, they do get out in the community, there's no doubt. But the ambassadors, the ex-players also have a big role. Rod, your hands were pretty full though in terms of uh, your police work. Tell us how that's evolved in, in recent years. Well, now I'm uh, part of Youth Command Bill, which is really rewarding because when I was a kid, uh, PCYC saved me. So uh, mm. we have a partnership with them. And I'm the supervisor of four clubs, so a lot of the kids that come, um, I see my mates and kids I grew up with, um, you know, struggling to mm. get, to get through his school life and and their family environment. They, they they're born into these families, so they have to deal with things uh, that I had to deal with. So I feel like I'm in a really good position to help them and lead them to the good side. That that is such an interesting aspect of bringing kids through, particularly troubled kids, and that is getting through to them. It's, 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 a, well, it's a bit of a lottery, really. There's no, as you were saying, has in terms of transitioning to retirement, there's no one-size-fits-all, is there? There's no sort of code That's book right. you can pick up and no. say, well, this is going to work. So, Rod, I, I guess it seems strange, but someone with a squeaky clean, your silver spoon background – they're, they're going to have a much harder time, aren't they, getting through to those kids. They just can't identify. Yeah, unfortunately. Um, and like you said, Bill, every kid is different. Mm. Uh, one week they'll want to get up and come to the program. The next week they'll come to the program, they won't want to engage or play games or have anything to eat. Um, and one week they won't talk to you. So yeah. you just got to persist and it takes a long time to build a relationship with them. So it, it's worth it, but mm. it, it is a time-consuming process. Has again for details. I'm, I don't mean to sound like I'm flogging the book, but has this biography. We 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 dealt with some of these issues, not not issues of Can your you own get making. The book now? Well, I, I, I wish I you mean, could. I, I, mean, I know. Yeah, I've had yeah, people ask yeah, for it. You're pumping the book. We can't even get it. Yeah, good point. Um, but you you had obviously a, a very tough childhood in, in yeah. a country that was ravaged by war at the time. So this was not a trouble of your own making. It was it was a making of other people that affected your family greatly before you came to Australia. So I guess. Uh, th- th- but when you deal with young kids, how do you, how do you try and you know sort of get through? I know you don't work directly as Rod does as, as yeah, a, yeah. In, in an official capacity, but you've experienced this, haven't you? Yeah. Look, for me, um, you know, I questioned a lot when I was you know during my career, and, uh, and I was just in Rod actually outside that during that sort of especially that decade, I went through hell. You know, being a bulldog and being a Lebanese Muslim as well. So mm, if, mm. if one year, if it's not you know, salary cap dramas and Super League and whatever. On the other hand, it's September 11, the Bali bombings and um, Cronulla riots, you know what I'm saying? If it's the, not yep. the, you know, the, the rape, um, you know, thing that happened in the area north. So there's, there was always something coming up. If it's not that one, it's that one. And I happen to be in between both. So, and, you know, you question as in why me, but now you know why because you, I can actually be able to share my story with everyone. Mm. So when some kid goes, oh, you don't understand, I'm like, oh, try me, you know, one, two, and three, and four coming, you know, didn't speak one word of English, coming to Australia at the yep. age of 12, being able to sort of get bullied at school, um, you know, war-torn countries in, in, in overseas that we had to, you know, hide in shelter and you hear the whistle of the rocket just going through from one building to another. So all these 
these memories resonate and they still here and they still haunt you, you know what I mean? So, um, but it just allows me to be able to sort of engage with them and share my story. And once I share my story, that's where I sort of be able to communicate with them and interact. And that's what you want. You want them to open up and feel have a safe place to be able to just engage and talk. And once they do that, they feel comfortable and then hopefully you can sort of help them out. A lot of the troubles you guys have witnessed and have tried to help with, uh, they're generational. I guess, Rod, and you said this to me off camera, um, <laughs> any any breakthrough, any success is something that you live for. Well, that's the thing we say in Youth Command. If you save one from a life of crime, you've won lotto because there's a lot of work that goes into it and mm-hmm. um, yeah, you have to overcome and um, go through things before you get to the other end. So um, that's how I think of it anyway. Yeah, and look, credit to Rocket too. I, I remember during the time when I was going through all these things and there was a lot of scrutiny on the younger guys, particularly the Lebanese Muslims around the area. And I remember Rod always, you know, grabbing him and saying, look, if there's anything I can do, if, um, if, I, if, if I can talk to someone, you know, mm. please let me know. I'm here to help out. So he's always had that attitude, Rock. And I admired that, you know what I mean? And I respected him a lot more um, for, for, for doing that. And he's always told me, I remember that time when you pull someone over at the time, you know what I mean? He'd rather sit there and talk to them and engage and be able to sort of give, give them that warning Mm. As long as hopefully that don't repeat and depends yeah. obviously on the you know on um, the individual on the, on, yeah. the, on the penalty itself you know what I mean and then that way it, it again it resonates and then they learn from that instead of just saying throwing the book at someone and going here you go you know and and of course again it depends on the crime or depends sure. on the penalty you know so I know yeah. what you mean because they they're, they're dealing with negativity at home yeah. primarily and yeah. they get more negativity elsewhere it's it's hard to get that yeah. to find the the balance isn't it yeah and and the first thing. Bill, you don't want to say to him as a cop is, you know, we never come to something when it's positive. It's always when you need us or yeah. when something bad's happened or when you've made a mistake. So it, it's really hard, but with experience, you can have a positive outlook and say, look, okay, you, you might have done something wrong, but yeah. let's just make sure you don't do it again. And yeah. you know, Look, one of the sergeant actually made a really good comment at the time when I was doing it in school and he said, for some reason, he goes, oh, he was at the Easter show and he was walking past a parent with a kid and then the parent turned around to their kid and said, if you do something naughty, I'm going to call the police. So that negativity, you know what I mean, started, yeah. it starts sort of with us as well as parents yeah. to be able to sort of pass on. And in fact, I looked back and I thought, you know, my wife and I, in particular my wife, she always went out of her way when there was a police officer or a fire brigade or something just to introduce them to the kids and get them to talk mm. to be able to sort of feel, you know I mean, you can communicate, yeah. you can have a chat. They're not, you know, they're like, you know, <laughs> And they're not just there to scare you. And has, just on that point, I pull up every yeah. parent I say, uh, I see yeah. that says to their child, watch out, the police are going to get you. I yeah. say, hey, don't yeah. tell them that because That's when right. they need us, they won't come to us. Yeah. So you yeah. tell them, and I always say to the kids, yeah. no matter what, we don't care what you've done, we'll always help you. Insane. No, we're not saying all police yeah. are good, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, come on, Hans, come on. That's not fair. Oh, just kidding. <laughs> The uh, in 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 summary though we've gone from you know difficult transition into retirement. Are you guys kind of in a nice place now with with where you sit? And I'm talking in terms of doing something with the role you played as as professional athletes, as as very popular athletes. Are you kind of happy now with where you sit? Ah, uh, look for me. I, of course, you know you finally find your fee, and you you, you just. Um, you move on in, in, a, in life, you know. So, uh, again, it's all about learning and um, making hopefully the right decisions, you know, moving forward. So um, uh, the only obstacle in my life at the moment is, is finishing renovation with all, <laughs> <laughs> with, with all these tradies and and, 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 um, and for them to turn up on time and finish off and all that. So that's probably the only obstacle at the moment that I'm having with. But um, other than that, preparing yeah. preparing for a grand final, isn't <laughs> yeah. it? But still... Yeah. yeah, and Bill, I'm very content where I am now. Um, me and my wife, we we work for our holidays. Our, our girls are pretty successful, um, so we enjoy the stuff that they are going through. And I feel really privileged, and I'm pretty sure Has does. We spent a lot of time for a club that was fantastic, and we made so many good mates. And we played all right footy too. We used to win games. <laughs> uh, on that point, <laughs> Rod Silver, Hasabel Basri, Unleashed. We will talk about the dog days after this. Let's go in the sheds. Welcome back to Unleashed. Rod Silver and Hazamel Masri are our guests this week. A little later we'll go in the sheds and we'll also talk about the dog days. Some amazing times these guys have had 
for this club. But right now, let's talk about the situation as it stands. And it's reached a point, gentlemen, where Cameron Seraldo, I talked last week about how honest he was about the team's performance. And he went a step further in the last game uh, in the post-match news conference. And I don't know how much further he can go. He has uh, talked about making changes and Carl Oluapu will start the game this week. Uh, That's the major change on the team list. Josh Reynolds goes back to the bench. Josh Adokar comes into the side for the first time in a while. That'll certainly add a spark. But there is pressure building on this team. There is no doubt. Even though we had limited expectations at the start of the year, we're all acknowledging and accepting it's a developing side. There's certainly some pressure developing. Yeah, I would agree, Bill. Um, unfortunately, for those guys in this team, once you wear that jersey, there, there is an expectation that um, we do pretty good. So um, I think there's a little bit of frustration about um, how much success we've had because of, you know, how our supporters feel about our team. Um, and I know they're trying hard. Um, it would just be nice to get a couple of wins. Yeah, look, we're obviously doing a bit of work as an ambassador and on game day. So walking from one corporate box to one other sometimes. So you hear a lot of the complaints <laughs> and the lack of pa- – I can't, sorry. Patience. I'll take that back. No, I patience. can't say lack of patience because they've been patient for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> it's a fair so, point. Yeah. So, so, so therefore, um, and you know, obviously with a lot of hope, we had the launch here and yeah. you see people, you know, like just rejuvenated, they're excited, they're mm-hmm. full of energy and looking forward for a new season. Look – I, I, we're not we're not here, and I'm I'm not going to sit there and bag any of the players because they're actually trying. You know, what I mean, they're trying mm. their butts off in there. Um, things, you know, hasn't gone our way. Obviously, look injuries, and I know people. You don't want to blame that on injuries, but you can't play. Let's face it, you yeah. just can't play. It's different if you're like, for example, now you've got your team like the Roosters or the Cowboys, although the Cowboys just hit form in the last two games. If you've got your team there and they're not performing, yeah. you have. Yeah, you know, we can sit there and yeah, you know, yep. and, and give it to them as much as we can. But at the moment, we lack obviously, you know, some forwards. You know, what I mean, because of injuries, we lack some. Um, you know, we just need that spark and things just to go our way. You know, you'll be amazed. Like, hey, look, look at the Cowboys. You know, they just knuckled down, played one really good game, and that's infectious. And now all of a sudden, they get a bit of a roll on, and they'll continue to do so. The, the good point you make about the forwards, yep. because that, that has been an area where, I mean, there's been a lot of attention elsewhere on the side, but the forwards have struggled, and that's simply because th- there's not a lot of them yep. Yep. at the moment. There's not a lot of depth there. Well, we still have a lot of m- a few million dollars worth of forwards on the bench. Maybe if we uh, make sure Ogre and uh, Mace don't get involved in the drills, we might be all right in the forwards. <laughs> <laughs> but, it's yeah, I know. We, we can't yeah. – you know, I, I've – I saw the coach, he was talking about the injuries. Well, you know, um, you just have to deal with them, unfortunately. And, yeah, that's why we're struggling. But if we get our best side back, um, I'm, I'm pretty confident. Yeah, but, Rocky, you know, like you good. can deal with one, yeah. two, and maybe three. Yeah, but sometimes it's so hard when you get them all at yeah. once, mm. especially lo- they're not out for two or three weeks and you can replace them. Yeah. They're actually actually out for an extensive period. So it makes it extremely and, and hard. And the senior guys need to be there for the younger guys. Yeah. Because, but I'll tell you mm, one so positive thing about it. it that come hopefully next year with a few signings oh, yeah. and that, all them younger guys now mm. that have been, um, you know, playing <laughs> a lot more than expected, for example, for this year, they're going to be much better come next year. It's fast-tracking their experience, yep. isn't yeah. it, really? And and, and that, that is a positive, but it's kind of hard to see in the short term. Uh, it is, and, and, it is. And, but the other thing too is that, as you guys would well know, Sometimes a team can look pretty ordinary, but it might just take one or two little things yep. that have changed. It might be a – well, they've experimented with Matty Burton going to seven. That, yep. that won't be instantaneous. It, it looked amazing yep. against St. George. It actually looked quite refreshingly different, but then it's kind of – that's. And, and we can't forget that the other teams are watching us too and they yeah. do their homework. So yeah, yeah. whatever change we make, the other coaches are saying, okay, well, let's do this. Yeah. So it's not easy. No. Yep, yep, yep. And look, we've had, let's face it, we've had some really gritty wins, you know, yeah. some mm. really, you know, sensational wins that we hung in the game. We, you know, we, we, we stayed in there. We could have just sort of, um, you know, dropped the heads and, and, and thought, you know, we did good for 70 minutes and then and we've done that for the last for the past few years as well. You know, like yep. they've tried for 60 minutes or 65 yep. minutes and all of a sudden the opposition's put 20, 30 points and mm. it's a flog. Yeah. But at the moment they're actually staying in their game and, you know, towards the end. So I think the Cowboys game we played them early in this season and the St. George game, I thought that was very gritty and we almost had Canberra as well. I just thought maybe defensively there was just a little bit of, um, you know, 
laps here and there that mm. just allowed him back, that allowed him to keep being, you know, in front all the time, just some soft tries. And that's – if they can eliminate these soft tries, you know, we'll score points. We'll be able to sort of hold on. But just them soft tries we have to be able to stop. And As the last line of defence, Rod, how do you do that? Well, it's all about communication, Bill, and believing in each other yeah. too. I think there might be a little bit of um, insecurity around, you know, certain – players and they, they come up I know the coach would have a game plan about how we stop them and uh, just you know the split moment des- decision making uh, makes it hard but you, I suppose you just have to have belief in your systems and you know back back the guy that's next to you yeah. and I wasn't in that front line so I don't know exactly but from the back you know if they're on and uh we're ready to go, you know. Yeah, I think uh, it's all just communication, obviously. Yeah. And I know a fresh team and it takes a bit of time. But, mate, even if you get sometimes someone that's really eager and keen, yeah. if he shoots out of the line, yeah, he opened up the huge gap and yeah. they score, you know. So yeah. although his attitude is raw and he's yeah. keen and he wants to make something, but you just got to hold that line. you gotta be, you got to communicate together and stay together and hopefully, as I said, lose and win together, you know. so And, and decision-making is big, Bill. Yeah. you got to make a, a – and, and it might be after you've been doing three sets, you know, and you've still got to make the right decision. So, Well, I, I, I will talk about intuition um, uh, a little later because these guys had a lot of that together back in the day and we will deal with that. But just on that whole decision-making thing, I think that that is a massive yeah. – it's been kind of a it, – it's been something that the club has dealt, struggled with, the first team struggled for a few years now. It's been a, a kind of a typical area that has been hard. I don't know, how do you – how do you coach that? Is it is it repetitious? Does it just come through drilling and and trust? What what? How do you find it? <sighs> you need to keep that team together, you know. And look, you find it in Penrith, for example. They've had the same juniors, and they come up. They know each other. They understand each other's game. We've had an influx of players making their debut. Mm. You know, what I mean, and fresh players every single year, and that is actually hard to coach because. Yep. You need to be able to sort of build it and keep building it to towards you know to grow into something. So at the moment we haven't had that. We haven't had that stability because it's just been a turnover of players come and go, come and go. So um, um, again, it's just going to take a bit of time. I remember you saying has uh, that you always knew where this bloke was going to be. Yep. And and that seems like a very basic thing, but it's such an important thing, isn't it? And I guess right through the team, no matter what your position is, and, and of course the way they look at teams these days has changed since your day. They yeah. talk about the middle and the edge. Spine. Uh, but, but yeah, all that <laughs> stuff, it's different. But it's still the same it's it's the same same rules apply though, don't they? Uh, they do, Bill, but it, you know, we were pretty lucky. The the blokes we play were, were pretty handy. They they knew how to play footy and um we had that Team mentality, I suppose. It wasn't just about the individuals, although we had great individuals. Um, we seemed to be on the same page, and, and I suppose we were coached that way. Um, and, and that attitude of never yeah. give up. Yeah. Right too, you know, no matter what, you got to get up. you got to not let your teammate down. Nah. All these that, – that attitude it we, was just, you know, we man, had, entrenched in us, you know. So we, um, we had a bloke by the name of Bill Johnson. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he, his name keeps coming up <laughs> yeah. a lot. I mean, I've – Heard about Billy and, of course, interviewed him back in the day when he was doing what you – co- uh, 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 he was the physical trainer. He was very tough, Bill, yeah. but something probably that doesn't get spoken about, he'd be able to cater his um, interpretation of – he could say the right thing to me, as it's saying, you know, you need to lift or whatever, and then mm. the, the good p- trainers like Pricey and um, – Rito, he would just let them go. And then Ralphie, he'd say something to Ralphie because he'd have some smart comment to say. And, <laughs> you know, he just, be, he was able to pick each individual, although we were training and doing the same drills, he, he was just able to yeah. tap into everyone. That's a good teacher, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. Just yeah. knowing what to say to the to, and, to, to the and, right people. And, and and credit to him, he's, he's actually a very nice guy too. Don't tell him that. Yeah, like he, he's, he's actually a very nice guy. He was know, a good so, player yeah. too. Yeah, yeah, yeah tough, tough, tough as. Yeah. Tough yeah. as. Um, now, uh, just quickly um, on on the uh, actual team list, Carl Oluwapu starting this week, having been given some runs off the bench. How different is the mindset? Do you think that'll make the kid after a few runs feel better, more comfortable now that he feels like ownership of that position, Josh Reynolds going back to the bench, or how, how would you 
say that he Look, would be I, feeling? I, I think so. It's important sometimes when you warm up with the team, you know, and you train the whole – Week, and you've got to wait so off. long. You've got to wait so long. Yeah, you yeah. know, and, mm. and, and sometimes, you know, you cool down mm. on the bench and all of a sudden, oh, you're up here and you're sort of anticipating all that sort of energy that you sort of, you know, you lose throughout about at least then, you know, you're warming up with the team, you know, man, you're starting, yep. you're starting the game and you know exactly what sort of positional play and what sort of to run and um, and um, and this, I think the expectation sometimes burns you a bit because, you know, you, you come on the field and – yeah, you know we're behind by you know. Yeah, everyone's yeah. expecting yeah. You, you to know, do two, something yeah, by yeah. twelve <laughs> points or whatever, and <laughs> you got to come up with something. And if the first one doesn't come off, and you drop that ball, and it's like oh, all bad pass. Yeah, I better be conservative, conservative the next one or whatever. So yeah. I, I just I think it's a good move, you know. Yeah, so. and then and by starting with the team, he starts at the same tempo, yeah. so he, he doesn't yeah. have to come on and create like. Everyone that comes on, especially Josh Reynolds, when he comes on, yep. he lifts the tempo. Mm. But not everyone can do that. So yep. it, it'll be good for him because he's young uh, and he'll feel like he's, he, deserve, you know, he deserves to be there. And what we've seen of him too, he hasn't overplayed um, yeah, he, his he, hand either, yeah, has he? No. He's, he's done exactly what was expected and just yeah. sort of settled into the team and get a feel for the rhythm. I tell you, I'm, I'm, I'm impressed with his defence as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah. not a small yeah. kid. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah he's, he's been good. Yeah. He's been good. I'm looking forward to him starting. It is very exciting. Uh, interesting from Darren Andrews, our stats guy, that uh, the Titans have scored 26 points five weeks in a row. Um, I don't know. Obviously, Cameron Sorrello won't be talking about that at all this week. But from our perspective, it, what does that gotta, mean? We've just got to score 27. It's 27. <laughs> 27. <laughs> if we score 27, we're home. It's, it's a really <laughs> weird stat. Uh, by the way, the Dogs have only reached 27 points once this season so far, and that was in the loss to Canberra. Anyway, every team that has lost against the Warriors this season has won their next match. There well, that, you go. That's so there's something omen. in our favour. Yeah. And it's at home, so yeah. hopefully we can use that to our advantage. You know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. They're an interesting team, the Titans. I mean, they can be very destructive, but they yeah. also seem a bit fragile at times as well. I guess we can identify with that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, um, seventh place Raiders, a one win off the first place Souths. Um, and then you look at the other end of the ladder, it is now very congested there too. So we keep saying it week to week, if any team, as we've seen with the Raiders, uh, yeah. put a few wins together, you can, you can march up or down the ladder, <laughs> whichever yeah. way you're going. Yeah. I just think for us it's very vital at the moment to get that win yeah. mm. because you got – We've got the buy after that, and automatically, as, as if that's ah, the point, that's, you know. Yep. So yeah. it's very important for us to be able to sort of just jack that win this this game. It'll give yeah. them a lot of confidence. Go into the buy and then come back again fresh. And but it's 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 a funny season, Bill, because mm. the Panthers were ordinary at the start, um, and then they just put that score on the Roosters, and and the Roosters are yeah a different team altogether. So. I can't pick them. My tips are terrible. No, <laughs> look, I'm not. I don't, I don't want to overread it, but the Panthers do look a little bit like some of our dogs teams in the big eras, where they just through the regular season they would drop games, but it was it was like they knew that they were going to make the finals. Yeah, and uh, once they got there, they they yeah. they would focus. Um, but they kind of look a bit like that. But it's very early in the season to to make a judgment on that. Uh, we're with Rod Silver and Hazemil Masri. We're going to reminisce after the break. These guys had some wonderful times together and we really appreciate it. We're going to talk about that. Let's talk about the dog days. Time to look back on the good old days and there's so much to get through. We won't do it all today, there's no doubt, but there will be other days to talk to Hazemil Masri and Rod Silver. Rod, you joined the Bulldogs in 1995. You came across from the Roosters mid-season. Well, Bill... Uh, let's just fix that up. It was after six games and it was the Super League uh, um, NRL war mm. and I signed Super League. So I played the first two games for the Roosters. The next four set on the bench for reserve grade for the Roosters. So <laughs> once, they, once I signed Super League, I was never going to get a game. But I was very fortunate and, um, you know, the Bulldogs um, welcomed me with open arms. And I remember as a fan too, I couldn't believe how lucky we were to get you so early in the season. And it turned out to be a pretty good year for us too. Yeah, it was nice. It was um, That year was big in so many ways, but to win the grand final and be a part of that team was amazing. Um, yeah. We had our first child the week, the day before we played Canberra in a semi. <laughs> so I had to leave training early to be there for the birth and 
Yeah, it was pretty big. <laughs> You're not going to forget that year in a hurry, <laughs> no, are you? No, no. I, I, I just want to quickly, because Has, I know, you were on the threshold, uh, of course. First grade debut came in the following year. Yeah. So you were looking at all this, um, and and uh, but just quickly, a, an amazing performance. Uh, Manly only lost two games all season. So yeah. just, just your perspective of that grand final. Um, I, I just remember the, the great uh, Peter Bullfrog Moore, just saying we've got to win it for our, our captain because Barr was going to retire. Mm. He didn't, but he was going to. <laughs> um, and, you know, I remember seeing Barr early in the week. He, he wouldn't train because of his, he, you know, uh, he had a few ailments and because he was naturally fit anyway. He trained he put, separately most of the year, didn't yeah, he? Yeah, most of the time, yeah. yeah. But um, didn't Incredible. affect his performance. <laughs> and um, I'm so glad to be a part of that and it was a great way to finish that year. Has I know as a young player, you're on the threshold of the big time. Uh, I know you had so much respect for this guy. What, what what were your feelings that year and getting the chance to play with Rod Silver? Yeah, well, my first year was 1995. Um, so 94, I finished school. I was, uh, you know, went down the road here, Belmore um, Boys High School. And, um, you know, I used to come and watch the boys train uh, – not train, sorry, watch them play on the weekend. So all of a sudden I get chosen to play for the Bulldogs um, – and uh, lower grade, I uh, was meant to be playing for Flag. went straight to 21s when they got the squad together. And towards the end of that year, I think it's something like three or four games of reserve grade. And one of them, back then we had to, we could um, fly out. So we played the Crushers and I was on the same plane and I'm looking around <laughs> going, oh man, look, at you know, Matthew Ryan here, Johnny Timu, Rod Silva, you know, Terry Lamb is here. You know what I mean? I'm like... What am I doing here? You know what I'm saying so, and uh, you know Jimmy Dimmick and all the boys. Hey, you know, I was like, oh wow, man, how good is this? You know what I mean? And then um, towards the end of that year, as I said, they just absolutely just killed it. You know, they had some like big games and comeback games, and mm-hmm. um, it was really joy uh, joyful to be part of that. Um, that you know, they just said part of the club at that time, and. You know, the street of Bellwood Road here in Belmore, just amazing, <laughs> amazing. I think 94, yeah, well, 94 we made the grand final against Canberra, we lost, and then 95 came against Manly, and then it was, um, yeah, it was it was just one of these memorable, honestly memorable um, days that I was able to sort of hang out in, in, in the streets, be part of the people and celebrate without anyone, anyone knowing anything about you, so it was fantastic. <laughs> It'd be different now, has yeah. <laughs> How, how did you uh, how did you see this young fella when you were, you joined the club, Rod? And did you have to break him in? How did it work? No, no, Has was um, very uh, attentive. Like he, he would watch things and he would train and do extras and he's kicking and he would just do whatever he had to uh, and more. Um, and then in so many off seasons, um, like initially after his first year, but. In so many off seasons, I, I'd watch this you know, this man um, do Ramadan. So everyone was like, we were getting hammered by Bill, mm. and Has was getting hammered by Bill, but he couldn't eat. He, he could have a no, wet no, his no, lips, yeah, just wet his just lips, just... wet his lips. That's it. <laughs> and a lot of a couple of the South Africans were feigning when they came, and I, I just <laughs> had this appreciation oh, for Has wow. because I just <laughs> you know what he was going through, and oh. you know Bill was hard anyway, but just not having food and no, no water, amazing. Look, amazing. in saying that too, he eventually when I built up a bit of courage and I actually <laughs> spoke to him about it because I had tough. So he actually, it was tough. Yeah, he I actually understand. allowed me to do say the weight session later on on my own. Yeah. Right. Um, so instead of doing two sessions a day and you know physically as I said in midsummer it was mm. extremely hot. So um, I'll yeah. do the f- one session um, with everyone and um, pretty much as soon as I eat it at night and I'd go um, you know, and, and do a gym session. He'll give me the actual um, schedule and I'll, I was able to sort of go and do it. And, and that's because of Bill, we knew we were always going to be fitter than anyone. Yep. Yeah. Because of him. How did you start getting that intuitive relationship together when you'd cemented yourself in the team? And uh, I know has said to me a lot um, how much he respected and admired you, but also how you had a great relationship on the field. And these are the things that fans just love to see. 
And anyone who's seen this bloke running, it's like he's on roller skates. <laughs> it's it's just he glides through a defensive line, doesn't he? Absolutely. It's just beautiful Absolutely. to watch, Rod. Oh, mate, um, try being on the same, as I said, field with, <laughs> oh, with him, you know. And you had your I, own attributes uh, too, yeah, don't uh, worry. I, but I, I, trust me, that <clears throat> the defensive line, I'd still run the defensive line would be coming down that way and they're calling out, watch his left foot, watch his left foot, watch his left foot, <laughs> guess what? Left foot gone through. And I'm like, I can't believe he got through, but he did. <laughs> and, then, and there'll be six, seven, it'll be the smallest gap and he had ankles like that. I don't know how he'd go 100 miles an hour that way and just bang, same without losing pace. Absolute pleasure to watch. But it was, Bill, like, yeah, it's it's nice to get individual accolades, but when you're a part of a great team, they, they take all the juice out of the other side. So you, when they come up and it's broken field, you kind of light up because <laughs> that, that's, yeah. that's yeah. the fun stuff. But um, if you don't have those players in front of you or, and it hasn't, you know, um, other blokes standing out wide to take a bit of heat off you because you think they think you're going to link up mm. uh, opportunities but, but don't Rock, happen. One thing I wonder is that, <laughs> let's face it, you weren't the best trainer. No, but on- I did change. <laughs> I, I, I did change under Bill. I did change. Bill Bill called me a lot of names. <laughs> listen, I did want, change. Let's face it. You want, you want relax. The best. I would say relax. Uh, no, relax. No, no, no. You weren't the best <laughs> trainer, but come on the field. <laughs> mate, he was fit as, and he'd go and go and go. So I don't. That's credit to you, mate. I don't know how you did it. That you was know what I'm saying? So we, I, I didn't mean to. I didn't want to tell you how. I, I don't know if it's for this show, but we used to do secret sessions. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's been a lot of talk uh, in athletics over the years analysing the great sprinters and how they ran. Some were very mechanical, very physical. It was all like muscle. Others were very fluid, so it was more technique. Yep. Um, did it always come naturally to you, Rod? No, actually, when I was at the Roosters, they, they, uh, an old sprint trainer by the name of Jack Giddy said I was, I run terrible. So <laughs> I had to do a few off seasons with him, and I, I think he really? fixed me up. Yeah, he was, he was another um, very aggressive man, <laughs> but uh, he got the message through. <laughs> Times yeah. have changed, haven't <laughs> yeah. they? Yeah. There isn't much of that sort of thing going on these days. No. Um, but the other thing too was you guys went through Super League together. You touched on it before. Yeah. Um, it was the reason you came across to the Bulldogs. So tell me, uh, we haven't really talked about this on this program uh, to date and I'm sure we'll come back to it, but what was it like with you guys? I mean, this was a huge eruption in the game. Yeah, look, I think Rock will probably elaborate a lot more. For me, I was – because as I said, 95 and it kicked in – and I didn't make my first grade debut until 96. Um, so, and then although Super League year was 97, but I was still, as I said, I was nowhere near the big money as everybody else. I was <laughs> just was fresh. Never was I. Never was I. Was just, I. <laughs> I, I was just fresh, <laughs> not knowing what's happening. All I wanted to do is just play footy, you know, yeah. at that time. So, um, so 95, as I said, 96, I made my debut and then uh, that was it. I didn't, I didn't give and take. You know, I didn't get approached by anybody. No Super League ARL at the time <laughs> or whatever it is. I would, I would love to, but none at, none at the time. I was one year too late. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was weird though, wasn't it? It was. Right? It was it was different. Um, the two comps, you know, like it was weird. But um I think Super League was good because we got to go to England for three weeks. Um yeah. Yeah, me and has spent a, a fair bit of time with roomies. roomies with um <laughs> James Pickering. Um our room was the Bat Cave, so yeah. we we fitted I had no right choice. <laughs> Um, Who's the captain of the room? Yeah, one of, our, <laughs> one of the qualifications, Bill, you had to be able to sleep uh, during the day. So <laughs> we had a fantastic room. <laughs> I would go to train, come back and just <laughs> back cave sleep, watch a video TV and Actually, sleep. the boys used to come past and if they were tired, they'd come in because they knew we were sleeping. <laughs> was that because you were training so hard or was there any other stuff going on that you don't want to talk about? No, like? no, it was only because of the training and, and probably because we, we both yeah. missed home a fair bit. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. right. Yeah. I was trying to make it hurry up. <laughs> a bit too far from town. And, well, you know, we know yeah, you don't yeah. drink, so it couldn't yeah. have been much going on, that's for sure. Um, and, and not you know, England, is not, there's not a lot of, a lot of exciting places to go there. If you know the, weather, the weather's not so, that good over there yeah. either, Bill. So, um, yeah, pretty much we found comfort in each other. And, yeah. um, you know, I was just learning from the great man here, you know what I'm saying? Um, like after the first two days, we, all, we thought we'd alternate whoever knocks on the door, they can open up. But he just... 
I don't know how he just ignores everything and I've had to constantly open the door and close the door and get this and get that. It's like, it was and the master teaching I'm the apprentice. I, I, I must admit though, one of the neatest guys I've ever roomed with, you know what I'm really? saying? Absolutely perfect. Everything is just like everything, you know, just like. That's from having three I, sisters. I, I was like, oh, I was like you wow. Go. So, you know, just for fun, I had to go and go like that one time yeah. <laughs> just to see his reaction. But um, look, if there's anybody or that, ever want to sort of um, or going to make, you know, their debut or whatever, Rocket would be the man to honestly take him under wing. I remember he when I would um, – I got called up on Friday for a Sunday game. So that's my first real debut against mm. um, uh, the Tigers at time in Parramatta Stadium. And I happened to work for the club here because of my apprenticeship. I couldn't make it on time. And um, so, um, you know, Gary Carden, you know, found me in, in the dressing room and he said, mate, you're at the back, you know what I mean? Because they were fixing the ground, obviously, here and uh, extending the grandstand on Belmont <laughs> Sports Ground. So he said, right, Chris Anderson wants you at the back. And I'm like, what for? He goes, you're playing first grade this week. And I was like, <laughs> I, I had to pause for a second, you know, and change my boots quickly and, <laughs> and, and and run towards the back. And one of the first guys was Rocket, actually, you know what I mean? Come and give me a hug, you know, you know and <laughs> you'll be right. And I'm playing on the wing, never played wing beforehand as well. But look, um, obviously, absolute pleasure, you know, as I said, to play alongside him and um, – uh, you know, the good times and the bad times. You know, we played reserve grade together as well. We got sort of demoted there a yeah. couple of times. So we were, you know, we had our, our bitching session as well. Yeah, and, exactly. Um, I, know, want, we're, I we're will get together, to that you know in I mean? another show because yeah. there's, there's a lot of detail we haven't even got to yet with the late yeah. ni- we, late we, 90s. There's we, a lot going we, on. We even read bicycles on our oh, own, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, you know, <laughs> bit, again, as I said, Billy and Folksy and all that would, um, you know, Brand new bikes. Brand and new bikes. bikes Starting racing. from Belmore all the yeah. way to Campbelltown. Folks, he was big on the yeah, bike. Campbelltown yeah. and yeah. back on the M5. Yeah. And I'm like, did you say Campbelltown? <laughs> <laughs> it was a terrible my, group to be in the My rehab. first session, I turned yeah. up with a, with a, um, uh, what's mountain, bike. a mountain bike. Yeah, same, you know, so same. I'm, I don't know, like, no. This is the only bike I've got, you know, and <laughs> no water and nothing. And I'm thinking, what's a bike ride? And they go, they just started laughing at me. And they said, mate, we're going to Campbelltown. I was like, <laughs> what do you mean Campbelltown? You know what I mean? So... Mate, yeah. we spent a lot of time on a, together on the bike, just cursing everybody <laughs> all the way on the M5 yeah. and then back. Yeah. We even hitched the ride that back was together one scary. time. <laughs> yeah, that was very scary. There were so many trucks. The, 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 good, the, good, the good old days where you had to pay yeah. for the toll and that, so... <laughs> this is this is a secret. We absolutely—it's not a secret I, now. Come on, we absolutely <laughs> have it on the way back. And Rod's like, "How about we hit a ride back?" <laughs> I said, "Rod, I'm not going for it." So the next bloke, we just waited on the tolls. <laughs> one of the black had, had had a big truck and it was like um, one of these open utes or whatever, you know. And then Rod's like, "Hey, bud, how you going?" And it's like. <laughs> Hey, Rod Silver's like, yeah, yeah, you're going to Belmore? Goes, yeah, I am now. <laughs> <laughs> but we can't, you can't say that to Bill. You can't tell Bill that. You there. can't tell Bill that. Oh, now mate. Bill's going to know. <laughs> oh, that was on the way back. Classic. We absolutely had it. It took us four hours. Yeah. Four hours of riding. Oh, it was terrible. I just, and as I said, we will come back to this relationship because there's a lot of stuff we haven't been able to get to and haven't had time for. But just, just finally, Rod, how much talking? went on between you and Haz and, and the rest of the back line in those days. Um, and how much of a part of the, the game was that? Because I'm looking at it from a perspective of, you know, a team that we've got now that's gelling, getting to know each other. I, I don't think, Bill, I can't remember us talking much. Really? <laughs> no, it was kind of everyone knew their role. So, yeah. um, and we just feed off each other. Um, we had fantastic forwards. So, so it always was just like, built in the preparation. Yeah, and, and we yeah. had bloke, uh, <laughs> Terry Lamb who – who could play football a little bit and we'd just run off him, I suppose. I think, look, it's important to know the dynamics of each person as well yeah. and their and their kept, strengths. You know, their strength and weaknesses as mm-hmm. well. So Rocket was really good at that and I just made sure that I always hang around a little bit. I'd watch yeah. what they'll do and I'll watch what Rocket will do and then as soon as Rocket would, get, you know what I mean, will back up, I'm mm. always there, you know what I mean? Yeah. So therefore, um, you know, he'd give me the pass, so I'd score or he, if he give me the pass and someone else and I'd back him up and give him the pass and then score. So I think probably 1999 was a really successful season for us. We sort of fed mm. of each other all the yeah, time. Yep. Um, we scored a fair bit of tries together, you know, so backing up one another, you know, long ball, I'd get a yep. you know, pass back on the inside. So we had a good, um, you know, understanding there. Mm. And I, I just remember early in my time at um, the Dogs, I, I actually had a conversation with Bar about 
I mean, he's got so many tries. How he goes as soon as anything happens, he starts running up the middle of the field. Yeah, so yeah. that's what I tried to do. Yeah, yeah. I tried to copy off him, and I scored so many tries from just doing that. He sure did. Uh, has touched on 1999. We will come back to the late 90s on another edition of Bulldogs Unleashed, but we are out of time right now. We're so grateful that Rod Silver and Hazamel Masri could spend a bit with us. We'll be back again soon.